just to go through a, a pretty quick agenda here, we'll just go through some introductions um, and we'll have our awesome presentation by Nathan Stevens. Um, and then a lot of time for Q&A um, and just some open discussion and networking amongst the group too. Um, but I do just wanna make sure I note that it is being recorded and the session will be shared up to YouTube for anybody who missed it or if you wanna go back and, and check it out um, again. But for anyone who's joining this group uh, for the first time, this is a friendly and open meetup environment for teams to share the work that they're doing within their organizations. Also teams from our studio to share some of the work that we're doing, teach lessons, learn, network with each other, but really just allow us all to learn from each other. So thank you all for making this a welcoming community. Um, and if you do ever have suggestions or general feedback, I'll share a form at the, the end as well. Um, but we will have a, a Slido link for any questions that you have during the talk. So if you don't want to be part of the, the recording as well, you could also ask anonymous questions there too. Um, but I'll share that in just a minute. Um, but with that, I would love to introduce our speaker, Nathan Stevens. Uh, so Nathan will be presenting on scaling spreadsheets with R. Nathan is an enterprise architect here at our studio and has a background in analytic solutions and consulting um, and experience building data science team, architecting analytic infrastructure, and also de delivering innovative product data products. So with that, I will stop my share, Nathan, and turn it over to you. Great, Th thanks, Rachel. It's a real honor to be uh, doing this, and I appreciate you, Rachel, setting this up. Um, and thanks, Maria, for getting this going and being the inspiration here. Um, really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, hopefully, uh, I don't. Uh, yeah, I value everyone's time. We have a lot of people on the call, and so I, I want to make sure that you walk away with. Um, some information, uh, something, some new ideas, something useful that you can um, take with you. Um, and if you can't, I'm going to try to entertain you to some extent. So if there's nothing here new, at least maybe there might be a few laughs along the way. Um, I, I should lower the bar a lot because I'm, I'm not, I'm not great at it. So, so you're going to have to like look for the look for the humor. Um, but I want to. I, I've done data science for a while, and I, I'm sure if you combined all the years here, it'd be you know hundreds or thousands of years probably in doing data analysis, right? And in preparing for this analysis, one of the, or the prefer, in preparing for this presentation, one of the first things I did was open up Excel and start putting ideas in for my topic about why you should use R beyond uh, just Excel, right? So I'm actually in Excel doing work about things about R. So, so that, that clued me in on like, okay, where, where are we here? We're, we're in this world where Excel is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It's built, you know, um, oh, you know, I was going to give, uh, I was going to pull in this old video about uh, from uh, VisiCalc days, right? Where uh, the guy says like, they show them VisiCalc and they, they, they literally open up the wallet. They're like, we will pay you anything for VisiCalc, right? So like, like that's back in the seventies, I think. Uh, it's, it's so spreadsheets have been here for a long time. They're not going away. They're incredibly useful. Like I said, I use them to prepare for this presentation. Um, what I want to do is kind of give an overview of uh, this uh, relationship with um, programming languages. So um, with that, let me share my screen and we'll get started. Excel is not the problem. It's PowerPoint that's the problem. You want to you want to see the <laughs> knives see come now. out? If you want to see the knives come out, let's talk PowerPoint. Then the, then the knives come out. Yeah. So this will be this will be a friendly discussion. Um, all right, scaling spreadsheets with R. Why do we use? Um, why are we using Excel? We use Excel for a lot of things, right? Um, but you know, in in R, we have this notion of wrangling, visualizing, transforming, analyzing, communicating insights about data which is the exact same thing that you're doing with, with Excel, right? So this is a very uh, business intelligence like mindset, right? Like, and a lot of this presentation is about like, you know, making decisions, influencing, um, you know, taking actions, seeing results, right? In a, in a business setting, right? You can use uh, Excel to build uh, wedding lists too. And, and some people at our studio have used R to build their wedding lists. They will go unnamed, but I know who they are. 
um, in general, we're going to be talking about businesses, right? So um, it, there's a nice overlap here between what you're actually doing in the BI world between Excel and R and a lot of other language, a lot of other tools as well, like, you know, ClickSense or Tableau or, um, you know, uh, or uh, MATLAB or SAS, right? So, there, um, so anyway, we're on familiar territory. However, uh, if, we, you, if you've used Excel to any extent, you know, that you end up with some problems. And here Dilbert's boss is saying, did you see any errors on the spreadsheet? And he's like, only three, what are they? Your data, your format, and your formulas, right? So we know that as you use these spreadsheets, you know, you kind of run into some problems. And that's um, where I wanna talk about how R can address some of those problems. I'm gonna actually focus on two problems today. The first one is file size, okay? So Excel handles kilobytes and megabytes, no problem, right? When you start getting into like uh, the gigabytes, right? And tens of gigabytes, like lots of problems, right? It becomes much dip more difficult. Um, and do, introducing large amounts of data to Excel is kind of like a fireball for me. And, and th this cartoon actually represents both sides of my personality as I get into large Excel files, right? Uh, are the coals hot? Yes, they're very hot. I'm just about to put on the hamburgers. Before you do, could you toss in a can of lighter fluid and make a giant fireball? And I've got the most boring data in the world, right? So when I like try to blow up an Excel spreadsheet, it's like that, you know, fireball. But there's this other actor in my head going, yeah, you don't want to do this, Calvin. Like, this is not a good idea, right? So um, Excel does have some hard limits. Um, so in a spreadsheet, a spreadsheet's limited by a million rows and 16, 17,000 columns, right? Hard limits. Um, Good luck pushing on that wall, right? Um, there's some softer limits too around like the memory limitations, like I said earlier, uh, megabytes, sweet spot, right? Tens of megabytes, no problem. Start getting to hundreds of megabytes, uh, a, little, a little more difficult, right? And, and then you talk about like tens of gigabytes, that, that's a, that's a no-go, like that's, that's no bueno, right? Like it's not gonna be good, uh, at least for the Excel spreadsheet. Now I, know, now I have to be careful because I know there's some real pros out there that are more advanced in Excel than I am. And um, we're gonna talk about that, right? We're gonna talk about that, that's what's coming up. So just hold it, hold your fire, okay? So uh, the second problem I wanna talk about is complexity, right? Um, and complexity, this is a nebulous topic, right? I'm taking a multi-dimensional space, I'm putting it into one latent factor called complexity, right? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna define complexity for my own purposes in this presentation. But I think there's some intuitive appeal here too, because like I pulled this right off, you know, XKCD, right? The most complicated thing on the planet's a sprawling Excel spreadsheet built up over 20 years by a church group in Nebraska coordinating their scheduling. We've all seen it. We've all seen that spreadsheet, right? That's complicated. But let's put a little bit more meat on the bones and say, what, what are we talking about by complexity? Well, I think if you have, I, I think a simple workbook looks something like this, right? It's like a single data source some summary statistics, it's no data updates, it's got a few functions that are easy to understand. Maybe you throw in a drop down list for you know, fancy you know, use case show off a little bit. You have a couple pivot tables and just a, just a handful of sheets, maybe just one, right? Or maybe you know, six or seven, not too many. A complex workbook by, by contrast would be many data sources with advanced algorithms built into it somehow, right? And then dynamically updating the data on a regular basis with you know, formulas, you get F2 and like the thing drops down and fills up half the screen. All the formulas are nested like seven times over. There's visual basic scripts running the background. You've got several pivot tables or charts and they're all sharing data. So they're all kind of like linked to the same spreadsheet. And you've got, you know, maybe dozens or hundreds of spreadsheets. Like those things are terrifying, right? You open that's the spreadsheet, you're like, there's no end to the number of spreadsheets in this workbook. That's complicated, right? So that's what I mean by complex, right? There's this wide spectrum, right? You can kind of fill in the blanks. So why scale spreadsheets with R? Well, R can handle far more data than Excel. So in Excel, the sweet spot's really in that megabyte range. In R, the sweet spot's in the gigabyte range, right? So like handling a gigabyte or a 10 gigabytes, no problem in R, no problem at all. Um, R can also handle much more complexity than Excel because it's code based, right? So a complex workbook in Excel equals a simple script in R. So I'm gonna come back to this previous slide here for a second. So this complex workbook over here on this other column, that is what we call a simple R script. 
right? So that's simple for R. In fact, that's why you want to use R because R is really good at these things, right? So I'm going to show that in my demonstration that R actually can do these things really quite easily. So simple in R equals complex in, in, in Excel. All right, so if you put these two dimensions on two axes, right? Um, and you say, I've got a simple design, a complex design, and a small and, and then on one and small size and large size on, on the other axis, then Excel fits neatly, in my opinion, my estimation around these small file sizes with simple designs. No problem. That's great. That's why I was using them to prepare for this presentation. I was actually inputting the data right into Excel. So that's great. Pull it up, put some data in there, and monkey around. Beautiful. Um, when things get really complicated or really large, so we're thinking like that previous thing, like multiple levels and data sources and update, all this stuff, right? Um, I would argue R is really good at that, right? And, and can you use Excel in that world? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you're, yeah, you, I've seen some really creative uses, but R is, R is really good at that. I don't really want to talk about these quadrants any more than I already had. What I really want to talk about is the off diagonals. I want to look at where, when you have something that's fairly small file size, but very complicated. Like when would you think about using R instead of Excel? And when you have something that's really large files, a large file size, but it's very, very simple data structure, just like you know, one table that's just a little too big. Like where do you think about using R in, in that dimension? So I'm very interested in this boundary, right? And defining this boundary, at least that's what this talk is about. It's like, what, what does this boundary look like? What, when does it make sense to start thinking about maybe leaving the Excel world and trying um, some functions in R? So that's what we're gonna talk about today. I've got two problems I'm gonna um, show you. And the first one in, in each quadrant, the first one is going to be where the files are too large, um, but the design is very, very simple. So I have to stop this presentation. To the web. Okay, so the data, we're, the first data we're gonna use is uh, popular baby names from the Social Security Administration that are state specific. This is a zipped file. If I click on this, it'll start downloading. You can see I've downloaded it four times, right? It's 21 megabytes, right? Downloads very quickly. And if you open it up, it looks something like that. It's like this. Uh, names by state. This is the zip here. You can zip it. It's got 50 files in well, deep Washington, D.C. Um, and uh, if you open up Arkansas, for example, yep, you get this, uh, this file, right? Pretty straightforward. You can open these up into Excel, which I did. And uh, this is what it looks like in Excel. Okay, so here's Arkansas. And I loaded up every single state into Excel. And I did some Googling about like how to do that the best. And I came to the conclusion, it's probably just easiest if I just do this by hand, it took somewhere between five and 10 minutes to load everything in to every state. Now. All of these things are fine um, for each state because they all fit. So if I come over here to come over here to um, Arkansas, you can see that there was about three, uh, what thirty thousand names, something like that. Thirty thousand names, no problem, right? Um, but there's some, there's a lot of issues here right off the bat, right? So. Uh, the first issue I already mentioned, it, 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 I had to like load them all up. That was kind of a pain, but one time cost, right? So that's done. But now I don't have any headers. So I need to go back and I want to put the headers in. Now I've got to put headers into 50 files and that's that's a pain. I, did, I didn't bother to do that because that sounds like a, a, a nightmare waiting to happen, right? Um, when I put all the data together, yeah, it was 21 megabytes zipped, but when it was unzipped, it was 128 megabytes. And that's what it is in the Excel file too. It's around 128 megabytes and that's, large enough to get the spinning wheel on the auto updates that requires me to get the, you know, escape on the cancel because I'll be using it and then it'll just stop, you know, working. Um, then you've got things like, um, you know, the um, pivot tables here. 
are, uh, you know, one state at a time. Uh, that seems to be okay. Except uh, I found something really interesting in this process. Uh, when I got to California, um, I was looking for names and it turns out this drop down menu has a list, uh, a cap of about uh, 10,000 names. And in California, there's 20,000 names in this thing. So, so I can just get up to carry and then I, I can't get any, I can't get beyond that, right? Um, and so that's, that's frustrating, um, you know, and I'm just starting to hit some rock, rock edges here. But the, the real hard edge is like, I don't really want to do the state base. I want to combine everything and then analyze across states. And this thing is over 6 million records long. It's not going to fit into a worksheet, right? So I have to figure out some other way to handle it. Now, there are many ways to handle it. I mentioned before, you got BI tools, right? You've got other programming languages. You can pull out Python, right, if you want to. But this is not a talk about Python. This is a talk about R. So I want to show you what this would look like in R. So again, one of the big issues here is I can't load all the data into R. Um, let me show you what it looks like just to load in one state. If I come into import data step. So if you've never seen our studio, I don't know if anyone's new to our studio, but this is this is our studio, right? You get the R prompt down low, your R script up high. You got some tools over here on the right. So I'm going to go ahead and read in the data. I'm going to browse for the data. I'm going to go here. I'm going to pull up Arkansas again. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I keep saying Arkansas. AK is AK Alaska. AK is Alaska, isn't it? So. I should know better. I've been to Alaska. I've never been to Arkansas. Um, okay, so we're going to pull up Alaska and notice the headers are off, right? We're, we don't have a header in there, so we're going to get rid of the headers. Okay, good. Now we just have generic headers. Um, this is messed up too, right? Uh, this is supposed to be male, female, and the F and the female, the computer thinks it's a false for some reason. So we're going to change this to a character. There you go. Now you're male, female. And you can see that uh, it actually uh, wrote the code for me over here, right? It, it just did all for me, which is really nice. So I'll go ahead and do an import. There you go. And, uh, and there's my code. So I can get that code in there really easily. And I can do some fun things. Like I can do, um, let's do, um, I can filter this thing, right? I can say, I want to filter AK, which is the name of the data set. And I'll say like, Name equals Jesse. Okay. Uh, what did I do wrong? Oh, because there's no name. There's no headers on this one. So it's got to be uh, X4. Okay. So there's my filtered data set. Then I can plot it if I want to. Um, I can do a ggplot and I can do some statics here. Do I want to do year, which is uh, x3 by um, count, which is x5. And I want to do a line plot. Okay. There you go. There's a line plot. Okay. Now it looks different than the, um, the one that we did in Excel um, because the Excel one actually had categorical names on the axis, right? So we have to fix that, right? These, these years are not, um, say it goes from 1923 to 1926 in the same increments that it went from 1992 to 1993. So this is the more accurate um, view of the data, right? Okay, so this is great. So I can come in here and kind of tool around a little bit and use a few little art things to like, you know, manipulate my data. But that was my, my, my hard edge. My hard edge was reading all the data. And so let me, let me read in all the data. And the way I do that, I'm going to use uh, the Vroom package because the Vroom package makes this really easy. It's a very good package for like loading in lots of data. So if you have like many gigabytes, that's great. You just have 128. It's going to be lightning fast. I'm going to go ahead and um, grab, grab all the files in that directory. So th these are all the files. And the Vroom command says just take the files and um, take the column and add a column header, right? So I don't have to like do, do that 50 times. Um, that's a really simple command. Let's go ahead and see what Vroom gives us. So it says that we have 6,000 records, right? Um, five columns. And uh, this tells me a little about those columns. And I can uh, 
you know, I can take a look at that if I want to, or I can uh, save this. So I'm actually gonna write this back to file. I'm gonna write this as a CSV. Won't take too long. There it goes, yeah, it's cranking away. Great, piece of cake, right? Super fast, super easy, no problem. I now have one file that's concatenated to all of them. Uh, no mistakes in the code because I wasn't doing any copying and pasting, right? It's a simple concatenation. Say, well, hey, I can do concatenation of files in any number of ways, right? It's like, yes, yes, you can. But here's the thing, like we're just gonna make, uh, we're gonna jump right into some exploratory data analysis. Now, one thing that Excel has that R doesn't have is this notion of notebooks, right? So notebooks are um, uh, formats that contain the uh, pros and the code and the results of the code all in the same document. And they're really useful because it lets you keep track of your thought process, right? So that if you go back later, you can see why um, what you were thinking and doing. Um, which is why it's called a notebook, right? So uh, Leonardo da Vinci was famous for his notebooks, you know, back in the day, um, they're still popular today. And um, so this is what an R notebook looks like. Um, this is, um, the, oh, this is my speaker notes. Uh -huh. Yes, that's right. I was gonna show you my speaker notes because this is where we come into, uh, yeah. So here's my uh, data analysis I showed you and then the files. So I, I wrote a notebook to keep track of my speaker notes, right? And you're seeing the, the, the process that I went through to, to do this. Um, there's the room right that we just did. And then we get to we get to this one here. So I put in a space balls. If you ever see space balls, they get to the, the now situation where they're looking at the movie in real time. And he says, you're looking at now. Everything that happens now is happening now, right? And Rick Morana says, this is now, what happened to then? And he says, we passed then. When now, when will then be now? Soon, right? So that's coming soon. All right, so let me show you the notebook I really wanted to show you. So here's the setup. Um, I can uh, load my packages in here. Now, for the, you know, the people who have been using R for a while, you, you might already have some preferences for how you load in your data. Um, I've showed you two here already. The read CSV is, the, is part of the you know, read R package. The room is package is really cool. It's part of the tidyverse. Um, there's this other really popular one called fread, right? And fread's lightning fast. It's super good. So you just pick which one you want, right? Um, and there's more than that, but these are three of the most popular ones. Um, you know, if you have lots of data, these become really important distinctions, right? Okay. So now I'm going to do my data analysis. Now, I just want to backtrack for one second back to this um, graphic here. To come back here, when you go into this larger file size area where you know data becomes largish, almost universally you're going to default back to something that's like SQL, uh, no matter what tool you're using. It's going to be look very SQL-like, right? And that's no different with R. So in R, I'm going to use a tool called dplyr, and dplyr looks like SQL because it uses the notion of verbs. And this is what that looks like, right? So I've got a filter statement instead of a where, right? I have a group by statement, a summarized statement, which is like, you know, the aggregate, you know, variables in the select statement or the window um, variables. Um, and then I do actually have a select statement here at the end, right? So th this is how you would manipulate data, a very SQL-like way of doing the data. So we'll go ahead and run that code. I don't think there's much of an output there. And now we'll just kind of monkey around a little bit. We'll look at most popular names from 1996 and what happened to those popular names, right? Um, Uh-oh, now what's going on? Oh, uh, doo -doo -doo. well, that would not be a surprise without a live demo without some error, okay. That must, be a, that must be a bug in the visual editor. So I've been, um, this is what uh, the documents typically look like uh, in, our, in our markdown and our notebooks. This is the default view. What I was showing you earlier was what is a new feature called the uh, visual editor. So you can kind of toggle between these two. And the visual editor is, is formatted. It's gonna give you a more like Jupyter notebook feel to it. Um, and for some reason, it's not showing me my um, output. So the way you start, you solve this is you uh, refresh your session and start over. Um, but I'm just going to go ahead and stick with the old, uh, the old notebook. I think here. 
We'll just stick with the old version. There you go. Most popular names in 1996, and, um, which is uh, Emily, Jessica, Matthew, and Michael. Okay. And then if you look at the most popular names leading up in 2020, last year, the most popular names were Ava, Emma, Liam, Noah, Oliver, and Olivia. Man, Olivia, just going strong, just going strong. Okay. So, um, yeah, and this shows you the, the run-up. So Olivia is this uh, purple line, right? And you can see it's been going strong for quite a while. It's been a popular name. All right, and then you can look at these shared names, right? So I'm going to take a look at these names that maybe are shared by both um, that are multi-gendered right, names. So Nathan, uh, just a quick question. Is it, um, would you be able to enlarge the font size a little bit? Oh, is it, is it kind of small? It's, um, how's that? Thank better? you. Yep. And then well. while I'm asking you questions, <laughs> one other question, because I know it's on a lot of people's mind is, will you share this script with us after? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's on GitHub already. It's in the notes and yeah, it's all there for you. Cool. Thank you. Okay. So basically you get to this and you're like, okay, this is cool. Like, uh, you know, I might have something to say about this, right? I might want to do something. So I'm going to uh, run, build an application. Um, this is a shiny application. This is not a shiny demo, so I'm just going to leave it at that. This is how you can build applications in R. I'm going to run that app and show you what that looks like. Okay. So in the shiny app, well, now I've blown it up so much I can't really see it. So let me... Um, let me open up a window here. There we go. Okay, so this is Jesse, and I can go ahead and add in my Colorado and California, right? And that's the name of Jesse. And you can see that Jesse's shared mostly a male name, right? And uh, there, there, but there's some females named Jesse as well. So this is what the female view, you know, looks like here. And uh, the cool thing here is like all of the names are in here. I can pick any name I want. I, Pick uh, Jesse because uh, for some reason I was thinking about Uncle Jesse when I pulled the name and I was like, okay, Uncle Jesse was popular right about here. So good, good job, John Stamos. You pretty much killed the name. So um, if you want to pick a different name though, like uh, uh, Rebecca, which I think was his love interest, you can see that you know you can pick any name you want, which is really cool. This is a very simple app. Now, if you want to share this application online, you do this with um, you know, RStudio's product, which is RStudio Connect. And so you can publish this thing with a push of a button and then you can share it with other people. And that becomes a very powerful tool to use in the enterprise, right? You can also share the notebook, right? So here's the notebook that's also on Connect. And uh, this will allow you to keep track of your content and uh, other people to collaborate to or to um, see what you're doing. So that in a nutshell is size. I'm gonna keep moving here because I'm gonna run out of time. Um, the next thing I wanna talk about was uh, this quadrant here around uh, where the workbook is too complex. So we're gonna to toggle over and talk about um, something, a file that's pretty small, but um, the workbook ends up being really complicated. So let me do that over here, come back to Excel. New data set. Okay, this is a new data set. This is about um, customer um, uh, data. Uh, this is called a growth equation that breaks down revenue into constituent parts. And it's got these cool little drop downs, right? Where I can choose a segment, I can choose a metric, and I can either be year, you know, year to date or whatnot. And I worked really hard on this thing. This thing took a long time to build. I mean, we're talking weeks to build this thing, right? Um, and this is actually the simplified view. It, it, in, the, in all of its glory, it was actually a lot more sophisticated than this. But basically you pull per, some, some data in the pre-period, you pull some data in the post-period, you write some you know, lookups here, some offsets to like get the data that you need based on the inputs here in the you know, parameters um, table, and then you pretty it up here. And you do that every week and you mail it out and uh, you know, people that like it go, oh, cool. And they copy it and paste it and they use it too, right? Now, there was a problem with this um, thing that I ran into, and, I, and, and that was that um, it was really hard to maintain. 
<laughs> like it was always changing and any change was very difficult to make. And sometimes the data were really hard to get right um, because the data were coming in in such a way that um, even the smallest changes were hard to track down. So this thing that um, was, uh, you know, kind of my pride and joy it ended up being um, kind of this taskmaster monster for me, you know, um, I created this beast. Um, and it's so much so that, uh, well, anyway, I'll just leave it at that. The best of attentions sometimes don't plan out, pay out well. And unfortunately, the, 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 the bottom line here is that, um, you know, this took a lot of time and ultimately yielded, you know, the, well, the best result here was I became very good at Excel. <laughs> so, so there was that. But uh, like from the business value perspective, I think the business value was a little bit off. So um, let me show you what this looks like in R. All right. So in R, this is another um, application. A little hard to see here, but um, this is this is the application. It's not. It's it's really not that bad. It's uh, it's 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 not that bad of a, a shiny application. Let me go ahead and run it. So over here, there we go. Cool. So I can choose my segment, right? I can choose, I can do all the same stuff, right? And I've got my output here, which is really nice. And I can download the data set, right? And this is really cool because if I open up this thing, I actually get back to the Excel output, right? With the chart and the data. And I actually get the data that I used to create those metrics here. So that's really, that. That's really nice because then you're just pulling the exact data that you want and the users can do it themselves. Now, um, again, this is something that you're probably going to want to publish to uh, Connect. And this is what it looks like in Connect. This is a you know, tool where everybody can access it. And, and honestly, you know, at this point, this is really fancy and nice, but I've, I've kind of gone above and beyond. I, it, you know, shiny apps are, sexy and interesting because they're you know interactive they're reactive right and people like that and it's great but it doesn't have to be that way and there are some negatives to this as well because getting this report means i have to like you know get in here to the application and then get what i want and then download it it's like sometimes you just want to email out your results right it's like this is the report email it out you know executives they don't want to look at an app anyway they just live in their email so so in that situation, you use a report. And the report here looks like this. This is the R markdown. And this is actually a simpler thing to do um, because you put all of your parameters here at the top in the header, and then all of your stuff is here. Now, now one of the cool things I really like about this script is, is stuff like this. This shows me all my formulas, right? Like anybody can read this. Anyone on this call can read this. So it's like, how do you define, um, let's see, like, uh, what is it? Like items, uh, like spend pre, right? Well, it's the dollars pre divided by the items pre. It's the pre, those, that's, that's how that's calculated. That's a really nice way to look at your code, right? So if you wanna knit this thing, um, you can come up here to knit with parameters. You can just choose, you know, the things here, like a shiny app, this is actually a shiny gadget and you know, get this thing and it will give you the report that you want. And this is actually a little easier to maintain. And if you put this into, if you put the same report into connect, you can um, do this really cool thing where you can like email yourself. So this is that same report and connect. Um, I'm gonna send that email. You can come up here, you can choose the parameters that you want. So it's all cool, right? So but you don't even need connect to do this actually. Like you can easily like just generate these reports um, from the code. Um, and, uh, and this is what they look like on the mail system, right? So they come across looking like this, where you get this nice email body and you get the down, the, the attachments here. Okay. So this report, uh, this code here, let me come back to the code. This code here, I, I dusted off that thing that took like weeks and weeks to build. And I recreated it from the ground up in R in about six hours. From six weeks to six hours, literally. 
Okay, so when we talk about complexity, that's what I'm talking about. Like writing the code here, like our, that, that things, complex workbooks just become simple in R and they become more, ac I would argue they become more accurate too, um, at least in my experience, but they become a lot simpler to do in R. Okay, so in summary here, how do you um, scale spreadsheets in R? Boy, that takes a long time. Again, I got to do a presentation on PowerPoint. Okay, how do you scale spreadsheets in R by using powerful coding tools that make your work reproducible and you communicate with apps and, and notebooks? So if um, you know, you're ever in a situation, or if you've ever been in a situation where you feel like your hands are being burned <laughs> because in your Excel you know, notebooks or you're like sweating to get through the Excel um, notebooks, I would suggest that, hey, maybe there's a better way, right? Maybe there's another tool. And here, uh, Zog has a stick, right? So Zog's actually figured out a better way to, to deal with the fire, right? So um, this boundary, hopefully this boundary is a little bit um, clearer. I think, I, I know I drew it as a hard line. I actually think that's a pretty wide spectrum, right? Um, I think there's a pretty big difference between you know, what spot you're going to move from Excel to R, but hopefully this presentation has helped clarify um, like why you would use R instead of Excel. Um, even in the event you're not doing like a bunch of random forests, right? Even in the event where you just need to do some, you know, regular old data science uh, exploration. So the last thing I will say is that in this R space, you know, you're doing data science, you know, you can do data science in Excel, right? You can do it in R. And Excel is um, a great tool. It's got, um, it's Turing complete, right? It's got power. Um, query built into it, right? You can publish things to Power BI. Uh, you know, you can, um, you've got the visual basic in the back end, which is not really my cup of tea, but um, it is a programming language and it, it works and it can be tracked. You can version control Excel. You can do all those things um, in Excel. Um, the nice, one of the nice things about R is it really clarifies when you're using the code. And um, I'm going to suggest to you that. You know, in data science, the source for all your results really is your code. It's not, it's not the report, it's not the output, but it's the process that you use to get the code. So in Excel, if you think about Excel and you like share some output from Excel or like in PowerPoint, so you take some pivot tables from Excel and put them into PowerPoint. It's like, that's nice. That output is really valuable, but the source for that was the process that you went through to get that information. It was querying my, your microstrategy with a specific query and then loading it up and then doing some manipulations, doing some cleaning, like doing some explorations, building some charts. Do, that whole process is where the value is in data science. And when you use things like R or scripting or you know, code or scripting language, like you get that part as a natural part of the process. Okay, so um, got some references here and I'm gonna pause and um, see what questions there are. I'm happy to help read the questions um, and just wanted to let people know again that we do have the Slido link for questions too. Um, so you can either ask with your name and or ask it live or ask anonymously. Um, but Christina, I see you just asked the question around um, what if the executive wants the report for every combination of parameters? Uh, do you have strategies to iterate through them and generate a full PDF report? And Christina, feel free to jump in and add any other context too, if you want to. Yeah, so if your executive wants every combination, it sounds like your executive wants to do data science. <laughs> so you can build uh, tools for that, data, that executive to, to do the, the data science. And that's what um, you would do with the Shiny application, right? So you build a Shiny application and you'd, you'd put that out there. Um, yeah, it sounds like you have a very interesting executive. My, my experience is executives, usually they want the bottom line. Um, and so you might be in an opportunity here to, you know, help the, the, the executive do some of uh, his own analysis. Well, this is, it's, Christina's my wife, but this is Casey. Uh, the, 
So what we actually do are Tableau dashboards, but then we also have to publish all, like we have to do all the filters for like every combination basically. And then we have this like C++ program that takes web shots of all of them and like puts this report together. And it's a really complicated process. So <laughs> that's what, that's kind of what I was getting at with that. Oh, that's so interesting. I actually, I actually took that part of this presentation out. Um, but I gave this, so, so I can send you a link of another version of this presentation. Actually, it does take the web shots, um, puts them into PowerPoint presentations programmatically, and it would allow you to do something like that. I, I think that the, um, so Tableau is a great tool, right? Tableau, is a, Tableau and our, our studio products are basically solving the same problem. It's just that R is doing it with code and Tableau is not. So I, I'd be surprised if there were things that you're doing in Tableau that you couldn't do above and beyond with R. Um, but the, the, the thing that you mentioned where you're talking about like programmatically pulling all combinations and doing web shots, putting them in a presentation. Yes, that's all possible and I've done it. So, yeah. yeah, definitely. I'll send you that other link, yeah. Good, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, and uh, one question that I saw that quickly got two upvotes on Slido, Leo asked, could you please show a quick step-by-step -step to achieve that awesome email with the graph and formatted table? Oh, you want to see how the email was created? Yeah. Yeah, I can do that. And then I should go back and I'll, I'll do the PowerPoint thing too here in a sec. Um, switch to my screen. I appreciate the interest in the code. I, um, uh, let's see, what did I do? Speaker notes. There we go. Okay, so in the R Markdown version, it's going to look like this. Um, I'm going to say so compose the email right here. And uh, what's the name of this package? Rich, do you remember? Um, Blastula uh, is the package that you're looking for. Um, and then um, DT is another one that you're looking for, like the. Um, no, no, GT, GT, not DT's data table, uh, GT, grammar of tables and Blastula. But uh, this is where I put in the um, subject line, right? And this is where I define the um, plot. And then when I compose the email, th these looks, this might look like comments, but this is all being recognized by R, right? So this is like actually pulling in the things in R and inserting them into the content of the document. And you can read all about that in the Blastula. Um, help site. And then on the R markdown um, side, you have to attach uh, the subject line here. So this is the subject line, this is the body, these are images, and these are attachments. So the XLS file gets attached here in the R markdown file. That makes sense. So that's going to, this is all the, the email. Now I also make the R XLS file here available as a link to the report. And that's this is in our Studio Connect feature, but because um, uh, I can make that work really nicely. But uh, this is the, this is, I think, what you're looking for. I, I wanted to just briefly mention, I, since I didn't take out the, the PowerPoint thing, I just want to make sure that, it, that you're aware that when you do like a presentation here, um, an R markdown, if you come here to um, presentation on R markdown, one of the options is PowerPoint. So you can actually generate PowerPoints here. And then in um, PowerPoint, uh, going back to the web shots, you can put web shots in here to like, you know, pick up the, the things that you're trying to insert to the PowerPoint, which is kind of cool. Right. What else? <laughs> um, I see a conversation in the Zoom chat right now on um, Cassandra asked, what level of security is available when using RStudio in a Shiny app? Um, because they work in the treasury with sensitive banking information. And I see someone else also works in banking too. Yeah. So we take, we take security very seriously at our studio. Um, I, it's always been my, so I've been able to be around for a while and I used to process all the security reviews uh, when I first started. It was a tiny company, so I had to go through all that. But it became very clear to me early on that we don't have a company without um, secure software. So I'm not saying that we've got everything, you know, figured out because it's an ongoing process, but I will tell you that, you know, we have um, onboarded 
um, hundreds of customers that have had a variety of security needs. Um, and we haven't lost any deals specifically because security. So if I come into support here and I do uh, security, uh, there's package security, uh, security package downloads. I think this is probably a good place. So SSL, right? Um, cross origin um, resource sharing, right? Um, yeah. So if there's specific questions too, I'm always happy to take that offline and help connect you with the right person internally. I'll just put my email there too, if it's useful. Yeah. No, I think the general question is, you know, can I trust, you know, my shiny applications? And keep in mind that normally these shiny applications are used for internal purposes. Um, like normally uh, you are like, you know, putting this behind your firewall. So that's usually the standard you're looking for is like, is it secure behind that firewall? Thanks, Nathan. Um, I see another anonymous question that was, Excel may be considered as interactive app for data analysis. How do you help Excel users successfully uh, transition to a shiny app developer? Well, yeah, you're in luck. I mean, there are a lot of resources around learning to do shiny. So if you go to, um, uh, was it shiny.studio.com? That's a great place to get started. Um, the, the creator of Shiny is Joe Chang, and, um, and Shiny is 10 years old now. It's been around for a while. But the cool thing about Shiny is that um, it was designed to uh, fail nicely. So Joe talks about the pit of success, right? So you might make a mis mistake, but Shiny is going to be nice to you, you know, when you make that mistake. It'll give you, it'll like find something else to do, it won't, or it'll give you a warning, or, you know, it'll like help you try to figure out the best way to do it. So the way, if you're transitioning to Shiny, um, be nice to yourself, start simple, and then just follow the patterns and uh, fall into that pit of success. I say that myself because I'm not the world's best Shiny app developer. Um, I have my backgrounds in big data, right? And so not as opposed to front end, you know, application design. Um, but I, I have learned um, that just dealing with, going with the patterns, going with the flow, you're gonna have a, a pretty gentle ride with the shiny. And if you do have problems, I go to community.rstudio.com. Um, there's a lot of resources on the community site about um, doing shiny and you can ask questions like you would like in a stack overflow type of a situation. I think it can also be helpful to check out the shiny gallery too. And I'll put that in the chat, Definitely. Uh, but it can give you a good starting point if you see something that you're, that's kind of like what you wanna do. Um, and, and go from there. The, the, I will point out one thing that's interesting about Shiny is that reactive nature is very similar to the Excel paradigm, right? So in Excel, you change one cell and it just trickles through the whole spreadsheet and can just have massive changes to the, the experience. Shiny is the same way. You'll change one thing and it will just reactively like uh, uh, percolate through the entire application. It's pretty, it's cool, it's cool stuff. Um, another question uh, on Slido from Josh was tools such as GitHub, SQL, Power BI, Tableau, Excel. Curious your thoughts on these tools as they, as they don't seem to be emphasized enough with respect to their use in the workplace. Hmm. These tools. I'm struggling with that question a little bit because in my, in my, you know, I deal with customers on a daily basis and it seems like everybody's using those tools. So uh, we get so many questions about that. And, and SQL has been, has just been such a dominant um, paradigm for so long. I was, I was joking with my friends. Like I, I did, um, you know, I, I worked with no, no SQL databases for quite a while, right? Like not, no structured things like, like, you know, Tableau or, or you know, Redis. And they always, there's always some sort of SQLness around it. You're like hide, right? It's not even SQL, but they put HQL on top of it. So, so I think SQL is one of the most enduring paradigms in technology that I'm aware of. Um, and uh, don't bet against it. <laughs> I, would, uh, I, I think it's great. I think I think everyone should. I, SQL is just a skill that's great to have. I, I do think I don't want to riff too long on this because I could go on, but the. Um, I think one of the problems with SQL in general with, with the world is like very few people get formalized SQL training. I, I was lucky enough to get that, right? So I learned SQL on the job, like, 
like nobody in academia talks about SQL, right? And then you go to, I shouldn't say nobody, but nobody in my experience in academia ever mentioned anything about SQL. And then I go into the job and that's all anybody is doing. So I, I learned SQL that way. But then I actually did take a training class on SQL and then talked about the query planners, right? And, uh, uh, you know, other clauses that, you know, maybe not so familiar with. And, and, uh, and window functions and the different sides of it. And that was very useful. So if you, if you really wanted to do something hardcore, you can get formalized training. I don't think it's necessary, but if it makes you feel like more of an expert or feel better about your, your skills, like those things are out there. Josh, let us know if we missed anything in that question too. Feel yeah. free to jump in. Not all around it. If, if I could um, kind of just clarify, I think you did end up touching on what I meant. Um, there's a limit on the words or letters you can use. But um, so with R, I learned a lot about R through school. Um, barely was exposed to any of the other tools. So it seems now that I'm backtracking to learn the other tools to match my use with R, but I barely use R in the workplace. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. So um, are you miss, are, are, yeah, are you uh, missing R or wanting R to integrate with those other solutions? Yeah, I guess I'm just wondering uh, your thoughts on uh, the emphasis around the other tools because they do seem like SQL um, and Excel seems like something you'll want to, especially Excel, master that before you master R based on its use in the workplace. Well, I think R is a niche programming language mostly used by scientists who are seeking the truth. And uh, if you still go to the R project page today, it'll say it's a language for statistical computing and visualization. And the, the, you know, the, how many companies are sitting around thinking, I just, I need, I need some statistical computing visualization software around here. That's not what they're thinking. They've got data, they've got operations, they've got BI, they've got these big systems, they've got these enterprise requirements, right? So it, it's not a surprise that like in academia, you're using R to do science and learning, and then the industry is using more enterprise tools. That doesn't surprise me at all. I think one of the, yeah, yeah I, I could keep going on here. I think one of the reasons why I wanted to join our studio was to help bridge that gap. But um, I think, uh, yeah, I could, we, you, Josh, you and I, we should grab a cup of coffee and talk. I, 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 I hear you. I, yeah, that sounds great. I feel your situation, <laughs> yeah. I'd love to jump in on that party if I can, because I'm a similar boat. I'll schedule yeah, a virtual coffee yeah. if anyone wants to come. Well, it's, <laughs> a, it's a lot of the work that Rachel Can I join in? Here, right? that, that's so <laughs> interesting, because that's exactly what I'm struggling with. What are you struggling with, Maria? Yeah, well, that's exactly the gap, the, the gap that you are talking yeah. about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the gap, like, the, we're talking about the gap between, like, uh, we're talking about evangelizing R, showing, like, why R is relevant in, in the enterprise. Is that what you're getting at? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, Rachel, that's been a good fight for a long time. Do you wanna, do you wanna respond to that? You're, you're doing a lot of that work right now. And I really admire yeah. that. Yeah, definitely. That, that's exactly what I wanna help teams with. So I'm gonna say in the chat right now, message me if you wanna get in on that virtual coffee. <laughs> um, but we should we should set that up and, and chat more about it. I don't want to kind of overtake this talk with that, but maybe it should be another topic. I wrote a post a, a many years ago when I first joined our studio about making R legitimate in your organization. And the tenets of that was to allocate, was to make a decision and allocate resources. So you're looking for a stakeholder, usually someone very senior in your organization to say, we will consider R to be an analytic standard and we're going to support it just like we would SQL or these other tools that we're talking about. And then if you can get out resources allocated to them, whether it be like, you know, like a server, like money resources or software, or you get uh, individuals like saying, we're going to train these individuals on those things. That's what you're looking for. Right. And I, that's a natural process in most organizations to recognize standards. And um, they're just because R is fairly small. It just hasn't gone through that process. There's an assumption that R is um, that data science is things that people do on their laptops.
with free software, right? And I think that greatly undermines the value of data science. Um, I think that, and, and it's, you know, Josh, you point out, well, Paul, what about Tableau, right? And what about Power BI? Power BI is a little different than Microsoft, right? So Microsoft is a different thing, but, you know, all these other tools. Well, if you brought Tableau in the organization, somebody went up in there and said, we're going to make Tableau an analytics standard for this organization. We're going to allocate resources for it. You have to do the same thing with the R programming language. You have to say, like, this is, this should be legit. Um, but, that's all, that's all in that post. I know that Rachel, yeah, we'll, I'm going to stop talking now, Rachel. <laughs> no, I, I'm happy to keep that conversation going. But Nathan, I was actually, I actually didn't even tell you this yet, but I was going through that post trying to think about how we could revamp that. Um, and so I may as well just share it with you all here and figure if you have comments on things that Nathan and I could include there or things that would be useful. Um, but it's based off of Nathan's original article on making R a legitimate part of your, your company. Yeah, so I'd actually, oh, go ahead, so who was talking? Maria? Oh, yeah, that, that, was, that was me sending email to Rachel, because uh, that's, that is exactly what I'm seeing. Like, you know, we all have that picture of, like, you know, our person, like, you know, in glasses, like, you're just, just doing some really awesome things which nobody really needs. But we don't really realize that it's, like, just one hand away. Like uh, lots of things are much so much easier there. I, I think most organizations want to do things. I, I think um, you said like nobody needs. I my my experience is that most organizations aren't very data driven, right? And there's a spectrum, and um, but but they want to be, and they know that it, it's relevant. I, I think going through the process of saying like you know, are you take all the emotions out of it and say like you have a business to run right we're talking just enterprise we have business to run R is a competitive advantage it brings in great people it allows you to do these technologies it needs support you're already using c sharp and you're using some python and you're using java why not use r and those are those are arguments that you can win i i've done it at, i mean that's been my history i've done this multiple times at past organizations you can you can win those arguments um, because they make sense right it's like um, you take the motion, the people out of it. You say like, "Hey, we 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 need this thing, right?" Um, and uh, you know, organizations will struggle a little bit because they don't. A lot of them don't get data science. Like, ah, we don't understand what you guys are doing, right? But um, that's changing. That's all changing, right? Like that's um, you know, AI and algorithm are like common vernacular now in in the world. Like, you know. My, my grandma's passed on, but if I had a grandma still, she would know what AI was and she would know, she'd be pretty ticked off about algorithms for some reason. <laughs> I, yeah, I think that it's mainstream right. and data science uh, is mainstream now. Lots of them are not data driven at all. And for them, it's one extra step that they need to do. And you know, like people are lazy. They don't really want to do extra step if they can, like, if they don't have to. So before they realize all the benefits, they need to do effort. Yeah, yeah, there's usually some sort of fulcrum and getting that um, uh, executive sponsor is key. Like if there's no executive sponsor, no one's willing to actually say, yes, this is what we're going to do. Then you really, you're back in that, you're back in the, um, the guerrilla warfare, right? You're just back in there like doing stuff and, you know, throwing spaghetti against the wall and hoping it sticks, right? And, and um, I, I have to say, like, if you're in that organization, there, there are better organizations than that, right? Like, uh, like if you're looking to like make an impact, make a difference and improve your skills, like why would you want to be in an organization that didn't value data science, right? Um, because that's, I don't know. Again, things have changed. Like when I was starting my career, I just had to find a job somewhere that in the, and, and data science and modeling were only known to a very small group of people. You're just like looking for those people. I, I, I've looked at job listings all over the place and there's like a ton of opportunities now. So um, it's still changing, but I, I don't, yeah. Anyway, I don't, I don't get organizations that, you know, just don't want to give their data scientists any resources. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, like maybe you don't want to be a part of that organization. I don't, that's just, that's, that's my feeling on it. So better organizations is our hiring? What's that? Who? I said, if, if uh, there's better organizations, is our hiring? You mean our studio? Yes. Our <laughs> studio has hired a ton of people, like almost a new person's coming in almost every day right now. Yeah. So check the job listings. And, yeah. 
all for internships to international yeah. students. But, but, but lots of students here, like sitting and waiting for that. And like you just I'm sort of you're downgrading, like we have to pay versus not have to pay. Mm. I will, I will say that um, we don't do a lot of data science at, the, at our studio, right? Because we're not a data, we're not a data organization where we, we build software, right? So that's our, our output is software, not, not data. So if you think about the things I showed you today, like the, the tracker, you know, like with customer data, like, yeah, we don't have that type of data. Um, Nathan, I know we're a little bit over, but there's still quite a few questions. I was wondering if it's okay if yeah, we go over a little bit. Fine. Yeah, no, I'm happy to hang on here. This has been really, uh, yeah, really rewarding in ways that I can't possibly explain right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Nathan. And um, also on that topic of like hiring and companies that use R as well. On community.rstudio.com, there is also like a jobs and gigs section where a lot of our customers and open source or pro post their jobs. Um, but also for people who are in this position of trying to convince internally, you are definitely not alone. So <laughs> I don't think the only answer is, is going somewhere else. So would love to, to chat more about how we can help with that too. Um, but one of the questions um, from earlier, Nathan, was what packages do you recommend for importing Excel files? Well, the yeah, the easy one was, uh, you know, uh, for importing Excel files. Oh, geez. Should have done my homework to see what's out there now. Uh, the, there Wasn't there like a read XLS? And then there's like an XLSX package as well. Um, yeah, you know, that's a, that's a miss in my presentation because I, I was showing how to read in the flat files, but yeah, just reading those things are pretty straightforward. Let, let me, um, let's see. Everyone what, in the what, chat is confirming that it was, it is read Excel. So it's, re, okay. So um, if I come in here to environment, import data set from Excel, yeah, it, read Excel is the, is the one that's used by default. There are, there are others. I thought there was an XLSX package at some point, but the one that's the one that our studio obviously recommends <laughs> um and then another question from earlier was can you version control excel and i think maybe we mentioned yeah that. there's a, the, the one i'm familiar with is a paid solution though so you actually have to like subscribe to it it's an enterprise solution which makes sense right because excel is an, is an enterprise tool like you have to pay for it so I, I kind of agree with that. That's one of the nice things about R is that it's, it is free, right? So if you want to use it, you can get started easily. Um, but yeah, there, there's ways, yeah, there are tech, there are tools to do that. I, I can't recommend them because I haven't used them. Um, but last, a few months ago, they released some new function uh, that made it turn complete, you know? So it's like, it's like Excel is there for, for forever. And it, it's not just Excel either, right? It's also Google Sheets. And um, it's also open office, right? So it's like you actually have three, you know, spreadsheet platforms to choose from that are you know, very common. I need to let me go if I just can quickly. Sure. My uh, my experiences, I've been using R and R Magno for three years, using it in the enterprise business. I first started people introducing, uh, getting them to know R. But that was a little step too big. But once yeah. I introduced them to our markdown, they could see the link with Excel very easily, very straightforward. And they love our markdown and it, it connects with them with Excel because you can work in the R chunks and generate nice reports easily, do it step by step. And that is my experience. And how I use it now in the enterprise, I use it in the oil and gas, I use it in the marketing business, is they have these ERP systems, SAP, Microsoft Dynamics. And when they have to do reporting with those systems, it is very cumbersome. And when they use R markdown, they, when they extract the data from the backend, put it in a small database, access the data with uh, R markdown, then it is for them easy peasy, really, they can generate fantastic reports and they love it. At least yeah. my experience. 
Yeah, I, I appreciate that feedback. I'd be really, so I showed the visual editor today on the demo. It broke at one point, which was unfortunate. It's new. I'd be curious to know your feedback, introducing these same people to visual editor, if that actually made things even better for them. Um, yes, yes, they like it. Yeah. But uh, they don't like R, but they like R Markdown. They love R Markdown. Well, I mean, R Markdown, I mean, you've got R code chunks inside of R Markdown. So, I, like, you can't really use R Markdown without R, right? Like, there's got to be. Yes. But you're saying they don't like the R script. They'd rather. Yes, yeah. You know, they don't like the R script. They like the R Markdown in fine. Yeah, because it's yeah. far easier to understand, to connect with Excel, how things work. Yeah, I, I like it. I like it because um, you. I just have too many experiences where I wrote R code and I came back six months later and I couldn't understand what the heck I was thinking. Uh, like I hardly recognize it was me, you know, and our markdown at least gives you some opportunity to say, this is what I'm thinking. This is why I'm doing this. This is what you should expect here. Um, and yeah, that that's really valuable to just to me personally, right? Like me as a coder. Uh, and then if you layer on all the things that are beneficial to other people. Yeah. And what they also like is about the different output formats that you can easily generate with R Markdown. You yeah. can make an it's, HTML, uh, you make, can make a dashboard, you can make a PDF, you can make yeah. whatever you wish. Yeah, I showed, I showed the PowerPoint and I showed the HTML, but yeah, the, the PDF is really nice. And mm -hmm. they're, yeah, you're right. Thanks for, the, thanks for the plug. Yeah. I see there's a comment here about uh, R Java. <laughs> I kind of agree with that one. That was a that, that's a real pain. Hopefully, uh, I try to avoid our Java when I can. I, I do the the one area of Java that I have a hard time avoiding is Spark. Spark depends on Java, and and guess what? Spark and Java. Spark is kind of difficult, yeah, partly because of Java. Um, Nathan, for the um, slides that you shared, will I be able to share that with the recording? as well. Yeah, of course. You have yeah. those hosted somewhere. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I just wanna... the one th can, can, I, can I put one thing I, I couldn't get into the presentation because we were talking about Excel, but um, the, all everything I showed on the, on the presentation day, that was all file-based, right? And there's another type of data that we didn't get into at all that would be interesting to do, and that's uh, machine data. So things are coming from databases, right? So when, when I built this presentation, I kept thinking about the data sources. I couldn't quite work it into this presentation. But if your data are coming from Excel, meaning that the original source of your data actually is Excel. So somebody got into Excel and inputted the data, then you're in, you're in Excel land. You're not in our land. I mean, that's you're going to be in Excel for quite a while. But if your data source is a database and you're pulling tables from a database, then I think the jump to R is actually a lot easier. Um, and I just, I, I personally would probably bypass Excel in most cases, right? And I know there's Power Query and all that stuff, right? But if I'm getting machine data, and that's not just databases, but that's like APIs, right? Or some sort of streaming feed, um, or even just curling information from the, or a W get from the web, from a website, all of those things, like I would like start thinking R personally. Couldn't quite figure that in the presentation because the, the presentation was very much file based, right? And when you have files, I think to figure out where to go, R, Excel, it's kind of like, I got this CSV. Do I open the CSV in R, Excel? I don't know, you know, I'll default to Excel, right? That's a much fuzzier thing. But when it's databases, pff, right to R. Anyway, thanks for letting me that in there. No, d definitely. A follow-up question there was, um, can R work directly within a database? Yes, the right guy. <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, if you come here to uh, our studio and you do connections and new connection here. Um, yeah, these are all the database connections, right? So um, you probably, I don't know if people use uh, Snowflake out there. But this is a snowflake connection, and uh, and then it will populate uh, right here into the connection window to browse things. So let's see if I open up my Maria database. Will that um, let's see if this is still active? Maria is like a hosted version of uh, Postgres. SQL. Yep. Oh, demo. Sorry, demo. Uh, test table. Test table here. Oh, it's the iris data set. And I'll go ahead and pull that up. 
There you go. So this this iris data are inside. So I'm, this is this is inside of the database here. If I want to pull that data into Excel, I can do that with the DEI package or the dplyr package. I'll try to make that. We've, we've tried to make that easy for you. Um, one of my main goals when I joined our studio was to make that easier. And a, a follow up question there, Nathan, was have you ever connected to any bank portals? Um, and bank. I know you've worked with a lot of our financial customers. Bank portals. Man, I don't even know what we're talking about. What's a bank portal? Like banks keep their data really locked down. We're, we're not getting into the blockchain, are we? Um, well, give me an example of a bank portal. Uh, we work with some banks and uh, they usually have, uh, they, their databases are usually pretty traditional. You're looking like a DB2 database or something like that. But um, I guess I need more information. Um, she said like Bank of America using an API. Yeah, well, there's lots of ways to interface with APIs through, through R. Um, so again, I need a little bit more information, but um, yeah, the bank group, the banks, the banks are, um, those environments are, can be very restrictive, right? So usually in my experience with the bank, it's not the tools that are the problem, it's the policies that are the problem, right? So, so um, I think what I've seen a lot of banks do is make it very difficult to solve problems, right? So it's like, can't solve this problem because we have all these restrictions, right? And so what ends up happening is that um, users kind of find a way to get around those barriers and those problems. Like maybe um, they'll just download the data to their desktop, you know, and just kind of email that around or something like so. But, but, but I'm not privy to any of that because we don't do that. Everything at our studio as an enterprise software company is all about board. So like the security decision, that security conversation that comes that we talked about, those all have to be answered by us because we're, we're assuming that we're coming through the front door. But my understanding is talking to the people at the bank, there's a lot of backdoor activity going on by the employees. <laughs> so, so I guess I need a little bit more information to help you uh, do a, a black ops operation there, your bank portal API calls. <laughs> yeah. And Nathan, one of the questions on Slido was, how can we connect with you to chat about other topics like enterprise solutions or architecting to workflows? People. Yeah, it just brings joy to my, my life. I, I'd love to connect with any of you. Um, I, let's see, the best way to do this. Um, my email is nathan at rstudio.com um, and I'm on LinkedIn, of course. Um, I used to have Twitter, but I've kind of, this is, I've kind of uncoupled from Twitter and Facebook. Um, so I'd say the email or the LinkedIn is probably fine. I'm also on community.rstudio.com. You can find me there too. Awesome. I see one other question that came in um, from Raphael. Can we connect R directly for any, and I'm assuming this means database, the DDBB, and visualize real-time data? So connecting R to any database and visualizing real-time. I'm not sure what a DDBB is. I know what a DB is, it's a database. Um, so I'm gonna assume that means a database, um, Raphael. Uh, yes, if you want to hook up like a Shiny application to a live database, that is very common. Um, we have a lot of customers doing that. And there are, there are some resources online for, for doing that. Um, you'll have to make sure you have permissions to connect to that database. But what you normally do is you run the Shiny application either as yourself or as a service account that has permissions to, to access that database. And then the tools are, are, you're just gonna use the same R tools to pull that data in depending on the user inputs. So for example, say I'm a user and I wanna like access my Oracle database and I wanna pull in like the latest sales data, you know? Um, I be able to go in there and like put a, a, a date range and that date range will pass through SQL and the driver and pull that data back and populate the Shiny application. Very, very common for us. Yeah, very common use case for Shiny. Okay, DDBB is database. Did okay, not, I lied when I said last that. question before. <laughs> One other question. Um, 
Anthony Lee uh, said, I'm new to R and the dopamine rush is so rewarding. <laughs> what would be the best way to start getting your hands messy? Is there a site with cases to start analyzing data? Oh man, that's gonna make me cry. Okay, so um, yes, I, I, I hear you. Um, I, I, I see what you see. Um, R speaks to me as well, right? And there are a lot of people that do that. I used to tell people that, um, like, I will just pull up R on the weekend and just kick around a few ideas in my head. I'll just do it for fun, you know? And I was like, ah, I want to try this thing. If you've ever used, like, SaaS, you, I can't imagine pulling SaaS up on the weekend. I don't know any SaaS user who sits around Saturday morning, like, I wonder if SaaS can do this thing, right? So there's, there is something special about R. Um, and, and if it's speaking to you, that, that's fantastic. Now, I lost the question. Was it, like, getting started? How do you get started? Rachel, you can answer that question. <laughs> so the question is like where to find um, cases to start with analyzing data. But I do think, and Jake shared this in the chat as well, um, but Tidy Tuesday, I think is a great project. So every week, uh, Tuesday, <laughs> there's a new data set um, release. So then people kind of visualize that data and then share it out on Twitter for other people to see. Um, I know a few other people said try taking a Coursera course on R. There's also a lot of great resources at education.rstudio.com too. Um, but yeah, if, you, if anyone has ideas, feel free to put them in the chat too. I think necessity is the mother of invention for me. I, like, I wouldn't go out, I mean, you can go to Kaggle and like, do that competition if you want, that could be fun. But like, if you have data, like, that's where things get really, you know, that's where really get the motivation to, to do stuff. So um, if you have the opportunity to seek out that data um, and like seek out a problem that matters, that's where, you, that's where I learned the most, you know, because it's like, oh, I got a challenge now. Yeah. It's real, yeah. But Tidy Tuesday is an awesome suggestion, Rachel. Tidy Tuesday is really good. I just want to check if there's any questions that I missed from the Zoom chat. I'm just scrolling through, but I don't know if I missed anything earlier. R for data science. Yeah, there's some books, right? Yep. Link for Tidy Tuesday. I think it might just be tidytuesday.com. I'm just checking real quick though. Yeah. Yeah, Education to our studio. Yeah, I mean, I think I think our studio's done a nice job of you know expanding the, the ecosystem. I mean, there's just a lot of pieces in the ecosystem now that is really nice. When I was starting R, um, I wasn't gonna date me guys, but I started using R pre-Google, okay? So like finding information about R back then was almost impossible. And then when Google did come out, it wasn't smart enough to distinguish between like R, the programming language and the letter R. So it's like you put an R in there, it was a worthless search, you know? You'll still see the issues now with R getting conflated with uh, Reddit, right? Um, like R something and sometimes you'll get Reddit as a result. So Google still struggles with that. But um, generally speaking, yeah, searching out there is going to return a lot of really great stuff. And we'll also yeah. just put a plug out there for rweekly.org as well. There's a really nice job of pulling in um, blog posts and different materials every week. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of, a lot of publishing going on. Matt Dancho, Mr. Dancho, <laughs> Daniel, I, you, uh, you, you must know Matt. Say hi to Matt for me. Um, but also if there, I know we kind of just started off with a, an intro, so going <laughs> scaling spreadsheets with R, but if there are specific topics that you'd want to dive deeper into, I'm going to just sign Nathan up for those if that's it. Yeah, yeah. Aaron asked if I started with the S programming language and the answer to that is yes, I did. <laughs> but I did a, um, include a form there too. If you have any feedback or things that you'd like to see, um, I'll try and copy that over again. Let's see. But I just want to say thank you so much, Nathan. That was awesome. And I, I love this. It's a real honor. I, I really appreciate it. You guys, I can't tell you how appreciative I am of this. Like I'm, I, I feel like this was just a wonderful opportunity. So thank you all. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Maria. And thank you so much, Maria, for, for bringing this idea to us as well. And, and thank you all for joining.
Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I think that's just the start. We have so many people going for that virtual coffee. So I think that was awesome opportunity for to connect not only like our lovers and like there's Excel former lovers, but also to connect continents. So that virtual coffee is going to spread out between Australia and US. That's that's awesome. Yeah, definitely. And I just said if people are interested please just email me directly so I have your email because Meetup doesn't give me people's email. Um, so I just put my email there. Thank you. But thank you all so much. Have a great day ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Depending thank on you, where you, you are, have a great evening. <laughs> so I have my students here. So we are moving on to our class and we have another half an hour of absolutely fantastic things to do. Thank you so much. Thank you.